So what I'm going to do really is just show you a lot of uh, quite cool videos and some of them quite pleasant, some of them not so pleasant, and some pictures. But let me say just at the beginning that um, I don't like borders at all. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of borders and I can understand why states want them. And I can understand that if you're born in a very wealthy country and you have lots of resources, you don't want other people coming in and taking those resources. Uh, when, I was, when I was young, uh, we were very poor. I, I was, had a very poor background and we used to leave our front door open and people could come in and sit. But now that I'm wealthier, I have alarms all over the house and locked doors. It's quite interesting. And it would be interesting to see that it would be a very dangerous experiment if we took away all the borders. Would the benefits outweigh the costs? So I, I don't know. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about. What I'm going to talk about is the, is the technology. So I'm going to show you technology, and then we can use it for, as partly uh, to help with the discussion. This is the United States border with Mexico here. And you can see this is a robot craft, remote control robot craft. And look at the clarity there on the border. Because you've got, you've got vast areas of border and you can't afford people all over them. So this is the kind of thing you do. It's not very long and it's silent. Now, there are many ways you can do this nowadays, many ways, and many of these are being, being developed by the military, which is my main thing, and many are being developed for our police forces, so we're getting them in civil society, as you said. And I'm just going to show you how easy these are to operate now. I have my own drone now as well, which I can show, you know, go into my neighbor's backyard and see with high-definition footage on my phone and record everything they do. They love that, really. Uh, but what I did was, some time ago, um, well, last year, I went with the BBC uh, to see the police's most uh, recent drones and how easy they are to work. And I'll show you a little video I took with my iPhone here. It was a very, very cold day. It was a really horrible, horrible place. Uh, it was a hideous place. So you can see this little thing that looks like a wasp. The camera's going to tilt up now. And this is how it's I've got controlled. That car there in, the, in the background. Okay. Now I just click there. And basically it starts to track us. Well, it's not tracking us, I'm doing this, and there's us there. Click that and that goes to the centre of the screen. So it's looking at us now. It can't be, it's not looking at us. It is, yeah. You can take a zoom snapshot, you can zoom in and out. It's, I'm not touching anything. And it's going to come in and land basically, okay? Now that cost around 70,000 euros. It's extremely lightweight, very high resolution cameras. You touch the screen, it takes off, you look at the map and point to where you want it to go to, and then you can draw a little circle on the map, it will hover. Very, very simple to use, anybody can use them. And that's the kind of surveillance that we're getting. But the sort of surveillance you see in the borders is a much, much bigger craft and much more expensive. Here's a little bit of footage and a film of the use. unmanned aircraft along the Mexico-Arizona border. Jerry Kersey is at the helm, and it's already busy. So Jerry, what's the situation we got here? This is a group that we got off a cold hit from a sensor. The camera spotted 14 illegal immigrants crossing through rugged, mountainous terrain some 40 miles away. They have no idea they're being watched from 19,000 feet in the sky. Border patrol agents should be responding. But then a surprise pops up on the screen. We got another group. We got how many? Start counting. There are now 31 illegal immigrants walking north, already 14 miles inside the United States. This is a huge area, and the Border Patrol lacks the manpower to fully patrol it. It's the reason some want to expand predator patrols all along the southern border. The group is starting to run across the road now. Stop, stop. Group is to your right. You're less than uh, 30 yards running. Group is running. Group is running. Oh, Jesus Christ. This is what we need. Those clouds there. Those clouds come at the worst time possible. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, you got elements out there that you don't control. So, 
But, you know, tomorrow's another day. We'll be right back at it trying to get more. So what happened there was there were some clouds and it couldn't see the people anymore. Although the more sophisticated ones used heat sensors so they could have detected where they were going. But the problem with this is direct, you can see them coming, but how do you stop them? How do you catch them? And that's when the worry starts for me, because what methods are you going to use to, to catch the people? And it could be like this, for instance. That's one method, but it's a little extreme, but I can imagine it being used in some cases, in certain borders. Here's another method. Now that was, that was deployed on the uh, demilitarized zone between South Korea and North Korea. Now under the laws of war, it's perfectly legal to kill anybody that's in the demilitarized zone. So when they first brought this out, all the talk was about having it completely work from its own sensors. It had a two kilometer range, so anything that moved inside that border zone, including elephants, so I don't think they have elephants in Korea, but anything that moved inside that border zone, cattle, would be shot immediately. Now lots of us uh, got together and complained a lot about it, and then suddenly what they were saying about it was quite, was quite different. And you can see what they're saying now, it's going to be remotely controlled, which is better. Okay, so, so the idea is you say to people, hold your hands up or we'll kill you, and they do. Okay, so that's another method if you're going to stop them. Here's a, here's a nicer one, I think. Uh, this is a Japanese one, so it shoots a net at people and catches them. I think that, that's a little bit kinder, I would say. Okay. Now, the idea of intercepting, this is a European project called the Talus Project. Are any of the Talus people here today? You have to shout. This is a funny little cartoon version of the project. I don't really quite see the sense of this one either. Yeah, I'm sorry about the music, it wasn't my choice. <laughs> it's kind of bland rock music we use in these videos. But do feel, feel free to get up and dance if you wish. Now this, this, is, this strikes, I don't know about you, but this strikes me as odd what, what happens here. It's a chap coming along with his briefcase. And it's, it's spotted him, they've spotted him, so they launch the interceptor. So he very kindly stands there, no reason for him to do so, until another truck comes along and arrests him. But of course in real life he would run like crazy unless the truck was armed. So this seems like a very costly exercise, but it's remote controlled. But the, but the new type of thing that's going on now, and I want to just take you a little bit into the future, and it's not really into the future, it's like future in, in a couple of years. And we start off here with the DARPA Grand Challenge. Now the DARPA Grand Challenge, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which is the research arm of the Pentagon. And they offered a $1 million prize 
for a car that could drive itself across the Mojave Desert 142 miles and get to the finish line. And the first year, a couple of cars got a couple of miles, and that was all. But the second year, this one, Stanley, actually finished. It's from Stanford, Sebastian Trun. And that year, three or four of them finished. Now, where the technology went after that was in two different ways. One way was this, which you've probably seen, the Google car. There's nobody driving that car. And this is through uh, Palo Alto, where I used to live. And you're going to see it in San Francisco. And this is the most crooked street in the world, Lombard Street. Okay, so that was one way it, was, it was went, and that's fine. Uh, that Google car is now legal in both California and Nevada, uh, but only Google can drive it because nobody else can afford the insurance, essentially. Okay. Now, the other way it went was this way. This is from Carnegie Mellon. It cost, um, it cost $80 million, which is quite a lot of money. It weighs seven tons, drives at uh, 25 miles an hour, because there have been a lot of robots, armed robots, that have been very unsuccessful, but this one is really powerful. And it, here's why it's called the Crusher. It crushes Cadillacs. That's a Cadillac. To pave the way for future truths. The Army teamed up with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, to create the Crusher. It can drive itself. So this can work in fully autonomous mode, which means it can detect targets and go after them. Now, what better way to protect a very, very large border region than a lot of these? And one of the big research areas that everybody really loves is the connection between uh, flying aerial vehicles and ones on the ground. So there's not, not even any need for a phone call. They could communicate directly. So you spot the you know, people sneaking across the border from the plane and direct one of these to come along. And of course, people will stop because if they don't, it will shoot them. And this is not good for a lot of reasons. Now, this one here is already deployed, and it's Israeli. It's called the Guardian. And again, it's another one of these things. You notice it's got a machine gun on it, and there's a lot of talk about this is fully autonomous border guard that will drive around the border regions. It will be able to select targets and shoot them if somebody's trying to creep across. But again, after a lot of protest, suddenly all the videos don't have a machine gun on them anymore. And the demos, you'll see a demo here with no machine gun. You'll see a drone here doing the... So it transmits the signal to a drone that comes along and, and kills the person, which is the same as it having a machine gun, essentially. Not a lot of difference there. Okay. Now, this one, they're just showing you for fun. This is also fully autonomous. It's called the Big Dog. You may have seen it. Okay. Uh, there's a good YouTube parody of that with two men with their heads inside a wardrobe. It's quite, quite good. I like it. But that's fully autonomous as well. So this technology is growing, and it's growing really, really rapidly. And I can think of very little else that it would be such good for than protecting borders and keeping people out, very much so. Just, just so that ships aren't left out. This is really company Raphael. I'm sorry about the music again. So they're in the air as well. Now, if we move on a little bit here, it works both ways. So there's, there's good news. Maybe have a new secret weapon to fight back against the NYPD's brutal tactics and constant I'm sorry, I was speaking at the beginning of that. Let me, let me start that again. But starting this new year, Occupy Wall Street Patriots may have a new secret weapon to fight back 
against the NYPD's brutal tactics and constant surveillance. It's called the Ocu Ocucopter. It's an unmanned drone that, as seen in this test video, can be flown by remote control, has a full range of motion, and can feed video back to the user. Certainly with toys like this, the movement can feed the NYPD a taste of its own medicine. Joining me from now from New York is the mastermind behind the Ocucopter, Tim Poole. So the, the thing about the Ocucopter was that the, um, the police, when the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, the, the police kept evicting people, but what they would do was they'd seal off the area from journalists and then they would violently evict people. So the Occupy Wall Street people got their own drone and then they could fly it in and stream directly to the web so they could see exactly what, they, what the police could do. And this is, so people, people will use the technology. We can all use the technology. Now already in Mexico, people are using drones to go across the border and deliver drugs. So you have a small drone, there's lots of money in drug delivery, I believe. So you have a small drone, you pack it with drugs, and you fly it over. Now the Predator would have a lot of trouble seeing that, and it's very, very difficult to track it. In Colombia, for some time now, um, they've been using submarines, little submarines, absolutely packed with cocaine. And hardly anybody ever sees them because they're so low in the water. But they found an autonomous one. And the only reason why they found it was they caught somebody with the plans. Otherwise, they'd never find one because how could you find an autonomous submarine in the ocean? So it's very good for delivering drugs. So you, when you develop this technology, you don't know how the other side are going to use it. And here's one I just want to show you. It hasn't been used for crossing borders, but I, I just thought it would be, would be perfect for this kind of thing. It's called the Sandhopper. Very cheap, sand flea. Could get straight over a border fence without any trouble. I mean, it's quite a high, high building. That's the end of it. But very robust. So these are being used in every imaginable way, and I'm hardly showing you anything of these at all, really, compared to what, what there is. I mean, for instance, the, the, big, the big drones that you've seen, I've now tracked 77 countries either have their own programs or are buying them. They're all over South America now being used for policing, hunting for drug smugglers, etc., getting across borders. So it's really, this technology is going really, really quickly. I'm not, uh, oh, sorry, I stopped my... PowerPoint too soon. Okay. Now the other thing that's coming up in the future is this idea of wide airborne surveillance. Again, you don't need so many predators. Unfortunately, the te well, fortunately, the tests they did recently didn't work. But the idea is that every craft has 64 of these. And you use several together, 64 cameras all pointing in different directions, like that kind of area. You have lots and lots of these all together, and the software is supposed to sew them all together. Now, the, the trials were good, the camera works great, but the software isn't working very well yet. But it will do, it will do. So the idea there is that you disarm a city, and then you can just watch it all the time. What else is coming up to the future? Here's another one. The technological dream machine that is the future of U.S. Navy unmanned aviation. The X-47B has been designed for use aboard Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. Its tailless batwing shape will make it the stealthiest unmanned system ever to take to the skies. Now, the thing about that one is there's nobody working the controls at all. That flies itself completely, takes off from aircraft carriers, lands on them, and it's got 10 times the reach of an F-35, which is the jets they have on there. And the idea is to replace all the manned fighter jets in the Pacific 
by 2019, 2020, round about that period. They've said 2019, but it might take a little bit longer. So they're going to be armed as well. And in fact, when, when that's what was alluded to earlier, um, I'm currently involved in a, with the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. We have a, a very large civil society campaign with people like Human Rights Watch, the Nobel Peace Laureates, Amnesty International, 42 NGOs, and we're campaigning to stop automated kill functions on these. But forgetting about that, what this means is, and the United States, when they talk about these, they always talk about them in terms of swarms. So the idea is to have force multipliers. You don't get one of them, you might get 50 or 60 of them flying together. Now what a great way to protect a border. In fact, how big is a border now? Because these things have very, very long distance. So where does a border end? Certainly, uh, and I don't, want to go, I don't want to get into a whole preach mode here, I could do, about the use of the uh, drones by the CIA, because um, they say, the, the idea is that you're, you're allowed to kill people in other countries, which isn't very nice, providing they're uh, under Article 30, 51 of the Geneva Convention, Protocol 1, which the United States hasn't actually signed, but under Protocol 1, you can kill people in another country, provided they're they're an imminent threat to the security of your country. But people, are, foot soldiers are being killed, loading a few bits and pieces of rifles onto a truck in the Yemen and Africa, no immediate threat. So, so how big is the United States border? I don't know how big it is now, but it's getting very big. Now this thing I showed you here, the X-47B, is just under the, uh, it doesn't reach the sound barrier, okay, it's just under that, it's just under Mach 1, so it's, uh, fast subsonic. But DARPA again, the Defence Advanced Research Project Agency, have this idea that they want to be able to send a swarm of unmanned aircraft anywhere on this planet within the window of one hour. And they've started already, they've got the HTV2 program and they've tested the Falcon airship, it's my last, this is my last one, they've tested the Falcon airship here, the HTV2 and it goes at Mach 22. That's 22 times faster than the speed of sound. 13, oh well, you're, you're uh, European, so 20,921.5 kilometers per hour. And that, so is, is, are we starting to think that we've got our country and everything else is our borderlands?